You know, it's hard to know what to say on a Sunday morning like this. I don't think we've had as contentious a period of election since 1864 and before that 1860 when Lincoln was elected both times. All I can tell you is this, you need to go vote. Um, and you say, well, you know, preacher, I don't know who to vote for. Well, you know what? Daniel served the purposes of God under Nebuchadnezzar. And Esther was married to Ahasuerus. Xerxes, go look him up in history. And Nehemiah served also under a pagan Persian king. So if those three people who were people of God served the purposes of God under pagan deities, under pagan, well, they were considered to be pagan deities. They thought them to be pagan gods. If they could serve then, you can go vote now. Um, we may be close, but I don't think either candidate's as close as Nebuchadnezzar. So anyway, uh, you need to vote. You need to exercise your freedom. Uh, you know, if you need somebody to tell you, I'll be glad to tell you afterwards, but I'm not going to do it now. But you need to vote. You need to, you need to exercise the freedom God has given to you in this country. Uh, I talk to Christians. I have great Christian friends in Germany who live under socialist government there. When there's an election, they go vote. Uh, we're not at that point now, so uh, you still have the freedom to vote. Uh, so go do it. Take your copy of God's Word. Now, I'm going to preach this morning this sermon to keep from preaching what I almost delved into right there. So if you'll go to Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18, I want you to look this morning. Chapter 17 is going to talk about uh, the corrupted church. Where are we headed? Where's the church headed in the days to come? And uh, a godless government uh, that will essentially rule the world. Where, where are the nations headed? Where is government headed? So John sees this uh, in the book of Revelation. He sees this. He writes this. We're going to look at those two chapters. I need a Sunday per chapter, but I'm going to do it very quickly this morning. So you keep up with me. I'm going to try to do more teaching than preaching. For some reason, God, in His goodness and His mercy, and I think it's because, if you'll notice... Christianity, when Paul left uh, Asia Minor and he went over to Philippi, the gospel swung to the west. And for the next 2,000 years, it seems as if as the gospel progressed across the Western world, God blessed the Western world. I would say that the Western world has been incredibly blessed by not only the blessings of God, but the protection of God as well. Uh, if you go back to the year 793, in the year 793, God reached down and he put his hand on a king by the name of Charles Martel. His father was called Pippin the Short. Now, that's another story. Uh, Charles Martel, you may know from history as Charles the Hammer. He has a son, by the way, whose name is Charlemagne. Surely you've heard of Charlemagne. Well, Charles Martel raises a Frankish army and in 793 goes to a place called Tours, and there is fought a battle on which Western civilization turns. Uh, the battle of Tours was when the Frankish army defeated the onslaught of the Islamic army coming out of the east who wanted to take and sweep up through and capture all of Europe. Had Charles Martel not defeated the Muslims there, you and I would be reading and speaking Arabic today. You move on through human history. It's interesting, his son Charlemagne, uh, under Charlemagne, he calls a guy by the name of Alcuin of York. Alcuin of York comes and leads what's called the Carolinian Revival in Europe. And out of that, he begins to teach young people, young boys, how to read and how to write. And if you don't think that's not easy, well, what's so bad? In the middle of the Dark Ages, there's one guy who does that. And that is Charlemagne who calls this guy, Alcuin of York, this scholar, to come from England, and he teaches them to read and write so that in about 400 years, when Luther prints, they have nothing to read. Luther's going to translate the Bible out of Greek into the common German and the Old Testament Hebrew into the common German, and he's going to put it into the hands of people who have been taught to read for 400 years and have had nothing to read so that when they get a copy of God's Word, they devour it. And out of that comes Reformation. Do you see how the hand of God works? 1781, in a place called Yorktown, uh, when an uneducated 
man by the name of George Washington, who had never studied military history, bottles up the greatest general of the day, Cornwallis, and the British army in a place called Yorktown in the fort there, and wins a victory over him, securing what becomes known as the United States of America. Sometime after that, God puts his blessing in his hand on a guy who ran for every office in the world and was only elected uh, to one before he was elected president, Abraham Lincoln. And God gives favor to Lincoln and to the Union Army so that the slaveholding South is not only just defeated, but that slaves are emancipated. But now listen to this. And he does it because Lincoln had quoted Scripture and said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. How in the world would he hold that all together? God somehow held the defeated South and the united North together so that to this moment we still have those freedoms. If you don't see the hand of God in that, you ain't looking. You come on, you move on to World War II when we faced Nazism, fascism, Japan imperialism, and God favored and blessed allied powers so that they won victory over all of those things. There was the hand of God in the 1960s on a man called Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who fought against Jim Crow and segregationism and gave him victory over that. And you say, but we still have racism problems. We still have some racism issues. But let me tell you something, folks. This ain't the 1960s. I lived through that. Many of you did as well. And I'm telling you, what we face today is not near as bad as what that was back then. All along the way, God has protected, God has seen to it that right would be victorious in every one of these situations. And I've just named for you a few. God's hand has been on the Western world, and we stand on the precipice of this election. And the truth of the matter is, we've pushed God out of everything. For all the blessings of God and all the goodness of God, and all the protection of God on the Western world, we have shoved God out of our national life, out of our social life. We've shoved God out of our educational life. Harvard was started by John Harvard, Reverend John Harvard, whose, whose library became the library of Harvard College. It was there to train, get this, not journalists, not lawyers. It was established to train preachers. <laughs> you can go to Princeton. Princeton was established to train preachers and can boast that Jonathan Edwards, the preacher of the First Great Awakening, became its president. Yale, that was started to train pastors, could boast that Timothy Dwight, the grandson of Jonathan Edwards, the preacher of the Second Great Awakening, and it broke out at Yale University of all places created, started to train preachers. Brown, when Baptists were run out of every state of the colony, when, uh, out of every one of the colonies, they had one place they could but go, and that was to Rhode Island because there, there was a harbor and a haven for Baptists, and they started a school there to train Baptist preachers. You know what it's called? Brown University. But every single one of them in this day is solidly in the hands of secular humanism and radical atheism. We have shoved God out of everything. We've pushed him out of the town square. We've pushed him out of the government. We've pushed him out of uh, 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 higher education. We've pushed him out of the high school, the middle school, the grammar school. We've pushed him out of everything in our lives. And we wonder why we're on the state of confusion that we're in today. In fact, the Word of God says it's going to continue in this position until we are essentially like Babylon of the Old Testament. That's an interesting thing that you'll discover in chapter 17. The church is called Babylon. And then when you get to chapter 17, the government is called Babylon. Why is it called that? Because in the days ahead, the church, the corrupted church, and a godless government are going to look more like Babylon of the past. And God will not tolerate a corrupted church and a godless government any more than he tolerated ancient Babylon. So if you've got your copy of God's Word, let me show you now as we go and we look at, first of all, the elimination of a counterfeit church. If you ask me, where is the church today? Where would you say the church is? I would tell you it is in the state 
of absolute compromise. It is compromising every position that it has held that is a biblical position in order to appeal to the culture. It is compromising every... Two weeks ago, the Pope stated that he was in favor of civil ceremonies for homosexuality. That is one step away from him issuing from ex cathedra from the throne, a papal bull that will embrace homosexual marriage. Now, I want to tell you something. That's nothing but heresy, and I don't care if I make everybody in the room mad. It doesn't make any difference to me. That's exactly what it is. It's heretical. It's ungodly. It's a compromise of the Word of God. That's where I see the church, and I watch every one of these denominations. They are wrapped up in materialism, pluralism. The bumper sticker that says coexist, that is pure pluralism. That is uh, uh, absolutely out of hell itself. My God is not equal to any other of those gods. He's nothing like them. They are nothing like him. My God reigns. The God of this book right here. They have given in to feminism. They've given in to progressivism. They've given in to every ism that should be a wasm that's out there. And that's where I see the church going. And that's exactly where John says that he saw the church. In verse 1, I'm going to show you. Now, the interesting thing is this. The whole of the book of Revelation is wrapped up in symbols and metaphors. But no one subject is talked about metaphorically or symbolically the way this woman is in chapter 17. She represents the counterfeit church. Uh, more symbolism, more metaphors are used to describe her. In fact, there are 10 in chapter 17. I'm going to give you eight of them. We're going to look at eight of them, and we're going to do it very quickly as I move you through that. Then I'm going to move into chapter 18, which is going to look at what I've called the evil empire, and I'm not talking about Star Wars. I'm talking about the one world government that will be led by Antichrist. I'm going to show you that, and then I want to wrap it up at the end by showing you the purpose in all of this. So here we go, chapter 17, verse 1. Here's the first of eight things that will symbolize or give you insight, metaphorically spoken of here, give you insight into who this counterfeit church is. The one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I'm going to show you the judgment. Now, understand, that's what's going to happen to the counterfeit church. It is under the judgment of God. He says, come here, and I will show you the judgment of, number one, first of all, this unfaithfulness that you find in the church, the unfaithfulness that's here. He calls her a great harlot. Now, the New American Standard softens that by calling her a harlot. Uh, you may hold the translation that calls her a prostitute. But I am almost certain that the old King James just puts it out there like it is. And let me, let me, let me tell you something. Expect anything to happen. It did in the last service. Satan doesn't want this heard. So uh, just ignore. If somebody goes into a screaming fit, just ignore it. Play, pretend like it's not happening. My sound going off, pay it no attention. You know, these are not the droids you're looking for. So here we go. <laughs> Listen to this. Watch this. Uh, the King James just simply calls her a whore. What it is, it's a picture of one who was in covenant to her husband who has now left that covenant and sold herself to all kind of acts of immorality. That's the church. That's the picture of the church in the age to come, in the days ahead, that's what John says the church is going to look like. It is going to resemble more than that pure virginal bride in a white dress. It's going to more, look more like the prostitute in Vegas on a street corner. Now, it begins there and it goes downhill. The second thing about the church is that it will have universal influence. Listen to the end of verse 1. Who sits on many waters. Come here, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Now what does that mean? What is that saying? Well, the many waters describes many peoples, many nations, many different tongues. And you say, well, now how do you know that? Because verse 15 of chapter 17 tells me that. If you look at verse 15, you read this. And he, that is the angel, said to me, that is John, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. This is apocalyptic language. 
And in order to understand and translate apocalyptic language, you have to look to apocalyptic language. Now, I know that sounds like a riddle, but I'm just telling you, you have to read and study this, and it'll begin to explain itself. That is what she's doing. She's sitting there with influence. That is, the church will want to have a universal influence. Why? What is she going to do? Because the governments will cater to her and give her a platform and make her rich. You'll read all of that in this chapter. She is going to draw the world into the worship of Antichrist. She's going to present the Antichrist as the Messiah of the world. Well, she comes and she wants this universal influence, much the way the church in China longs to have influence over every single one of its people, but especially the church that is growing out of control, and the Chinese government is afraid of it. Uh, that's why they're killing off Muslims by the tens of thousands right now, but nobody's talking about that in the news. Uh, they're doing the same thing in the church in China. Do you know that she, who is the premier of China, is right now having the New Testament rewritten? Have you all read that? I came across a portion of what they have rewritten already. And they took the portion on the woman that was caught in adultery and was brought to Jesus. And they have rewritten it that when they brought the woman to Jesus and they said, this woman has sinned, what do we do with her? Jesus tells the crowd, I'm a sinner too. Now, that's how they've rewritten the New Testament. Mao Zedong could not kill the church. She thinks that he can uh, rewrite Scripture and that he will achieve what Mao could not do. At the end of that story, Jesus sends the crowd away. And do you know what they've written? They've written that Jesus picked up stones and he killed the woman himself. They want to have a universal influence. You can go to church, but you go to the church with the Bible that I have written. So there's the universal influence. Let me give you the third thing. And the third thing is this, is that the church, the counterfeit church, will have uh, a domination over the government for a very short period of time. Look at verse 3. And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Now who is the beast? It represents the government that you're going to see, the empire that the Antichrist is head of. She is sitting on the scarlet beast is if she is sitting on a horse. And you guide, you direct, you lead that horse. Uh, you move that horse in the direction that you want to go. You want it to go. He will allow her to dominate the world government for a brief period of time. But now hold on, I'm going to show you what's going to happen to her and what the uh, government is going to do to her. So there she is. She has domination. It will appear as if now government finally, listen, I can take you back to Char I can take you back all the way to uh, Constantine and uh, the whole desire of the church to rise up at different periods and control all of society. Listen, I'm Baptist. I don't believe in that. Um, Y'all don't understand that statement I just made, but let me tell you, we Baptists believe in freedom of religion. We don't want to run the government. Uh, I'm just interested in the church. I'm not interested in the government. I know where the government's headed. I'm fixing to tell you in chapter 18, and it ain't pretty. So, uh, but here the church rises up as if it now is finally in control of the world, but it won't be in control for long. Look at this, number four. The fourth thing is the appearance. Verse four, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. And we read that and we think, well, this just speaks of the... Uh, opulence of the church, and that is a turnoff. The aggrandizement of the church, and that's a turnoff. The greed, the cupidity of the church. I don't think that's what it's talking about. I think it's talking about an appearance of truth. Truth is described in these very terms in various places. Truth is clothed in purple and scarlet. Truth is adorned with gold and precious stones and pearl. Truth is beautiful like that. And the outward appearance of the counterfeit church is going to lead everyone to believe this is orthodox. This is the way church should be. This is what church should look like. It is appealing every single cult that you can go to will have enough scripture added to it as to lead you to believe it is actually biblical. It looks biblical. 
It sounds biblical. But now look at the fifth thing, and the fifth thing is the reality. Look at the rest of chapter, uh, of verse 4 in chapter 17. Having in her hand a gold cup. Now I have to stop at that, and I have to think about that. The gold cup. Where do you see another cup in the New Testament? You see it in the hands, not of this harlot, but in the hands of Christ at the Last Supper who takes the cup of redemption and says, this is the new covenant in my blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Do you see? Here is the illusion that continues. Look, we're orthodox. We even look like the church, but look at what is in. It speaks of what is in the church internally, full of abominations, of unclean things, and immorality. He says, if you look close enough, you'll see. It may give the appearance. It may sound Christian. It may look Christian. It may have the appearance of some kind of orthodoxy, but the truth of the matter is on the inside. And you're going to see in just a moment that whatever a tree is, that's the kind of fruit it's going to bear. Now hold on and watch this. Look at number six. The sixth thing is the deception. On her forehead, a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great. That word mystery right there tells me this. There is more here than meets the eye. That's what's true to a mystery. When I look at this church that gives the appearance of orthodoxy, that gives the appearance that this is of God, it is a mystery. In other words, I'm not seeing everything that I should be seeing. So I look now next at her fruit. She is the production of perversion. Out of her comes the production of perversion. What should come out of the church? I've told you before, over and over again, what I want to come. You can go out there in the hallways and you can look on that Valleydale pathway. What I want to come out of this church is I want a people who know Christ, who are committed to Christ, who are committed to His bride, who are competent with the Word of God, and who are creative enough to go out of here and share that gospel with others and disciple other people. That's what I want to come out of every Sunday school class. I want it to come out of the elders. I want it to come out of the deacons. I want it to come out of the church leaders. I want it to come out of the worship service that we are a people who are committed to this generation of sharing Jesus Christ and teaching Jesus Christ. That's what I want to come out of the church. Look at what comes out of her. Harlots and abominations. That's the fruit. He says, look and see what comes out of her. She's the mother of harlots and of abominations of the earth. Everything wicked, everything evil, everything sinful comes out of her. She's producing, listen, she's producing not those who share the gospel. She's producing those who have perverted and compromised and corrupted the gospel. Y'all see that? Y'all okay? Y'all feel good? <laughs> Look at the last thing here, number eight. Look at the persecution. Now, this is a Sunday we pray for the persecuted church. Verse six, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with, with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, John said, I wondered greatly. He says, this is a church that kills the people who have the witness of Jesus Christ. She has actually been a part of the martyring of those who would share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Boy, if you listen, yesterday you think it was Halloween. It was really Reformation Day. You need to go back and look at how brutal, brutal uh, they were to the reformers. And especially if you want to see how really brutal it got, you get down to the Anabaptists and look at how they killed the Anabaptists. You understand why we have so little of our forefathers? I think they are our forefathers. I'm writing a paper. I'm writing a dissertation stating so uh, hermeneutically that they're our forefathers. You know why we have so little from them? Because they didn't survive. They killed them all. If the Catholics didn't kill them, the Protestants did. Uh, you, 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 need to, you need to understand, listen, this is just a picture of what is to come. You say the church would never do that. The church has done it in every age. And it's going to happen in an unbelievable way 
under the counterfeit church. But let me tell you, God won't permit it to last long. In fact, look at what happens. Get down to verse 16 and let me close this up quickly. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast that she was riding, the one that she was riding, that scarlet beast, he's describing it here in verse 16. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot. You know, let me tell you something. Satan has no love in his heart for anybody, even those who serve him. Even those who serve him. This counterfeit church will turn and serve the purposes of Satan. And what will Satan do? He will turn and he will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh. You're talking about Halloween. Here we go. He will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. This church will compromise. Listen, the church today is compromising with the culture, just hoping and praying that we will appeal enough to a pagan culture that pagans will come to church and join our ranks. I don't want them just to come to my church. I want them to come to Jesus. There is a huge difference between the two. Do I want them in church? Yes, but I want to get them to Jesus because getting you in church is not going to get you into glory. Well, I can tell y'all are all excited about that. So let's get to chapter 18. Now, here's the counterfeit church. He's going to eliminate it. Look at how he's going to eradicate this evil empire. There's going to be a one world government. It's going to be led by a man that we've called and already looked like, looked at, and his name is Antichrist. And there are four things that he's going to say right here about that one world. What is God going to do with the governments of this world? Where are the governments of this world headed? They are headed to the place where they will acquiesce and give power to a man who is under the control of Satan. You've seen it happen in small places around the world down through history. But there's going to come a day when the whole world is going to come and submit to one man who will have such satanic influence over the rest of the world. And what is God going to do? Well, there's going to be her desolation. Chapter 18, verse 2, And he cried out with a mighty voice. That's an angel. In fact, let me back up to verse 1. These things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. That is, this angel now turns the light on and says, let me show you the darkness of God. You think government work is dark. Thank God for Christians that are in government. The few that there, I pray that God keeps them from corruption is what I pray. I pray God keeps them from succumbing to all the pressures that is in that dark element of our of our day. He's going to turn the light on and listen to what he's going to do. He says, look at her, uh, look at her uh, desolation here. And he cried out with a mighty voice saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. Now you have to understand to the Jew, a hateful bird described buzzards and vultures that would show up at a place of death to pick the bones. Now that's what it's describing. It's describing death. That's what it's talking about. He says this, that the culture under the influence of this evil government is going to become a place that is the dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit. Now that's terrifying to think that government is going to come to that. As bad as it is right now, thank God, I think there are a few men and women still in government who are godly people. But it's fast coming to a day where they're going to be re rejected by uh, the nation. They're going to be rejected by their states. They're going to be rejected by the government. And uh, listen, the government, the culture will become completely dominated by demons. See also Daniel and his prophecy. Look at her defiance. Look at how defiant she is. Look at verse 7, to the degree that she glorified herself. Now, boy, if you want to know where is America today, that's where we are. Everybody is simply glorifying themselves. We're looking to glorify ourselves. We're looking for, out for ourselves and nothing else. She lived sensuously. And to the same degree, give her torment and mourning for this is what she said. Now, here is how she's glorified. Here is the pride of her heart. She says in her heart, I sit as a queen. In other words, I'm my own God. 
You think government sometimes feels like that? Lord have mercy. Number two, I'm not a widow. I, I'm not going to lose anything. And uh, the third thing is I'll never see mourning. Uh, I'm never going to grieve. Nothing's going to happen to me. Nothing's going to take my place. Uh, there is such wickedness and self-seeking in all of government today to the place to where people in the land are completely forgotten. The third thing is this, her demise. Look at verse 8. For this reason, in one day, now hold on to that, because you're going to see how quickly all of this is going to happen. He says right here, in one day, her plagues will come, her pestilence, her mourning, her famine, she will be burned up with fire. Boy, we're, we're going through a little plague, a little pestilence like right now. That is the whole world. You see where Boris Johnson is going to shut down all of England now through the month of November? You see what's happening in Germany? See what's happening in all these other countries? You see all of this that's taking place off of a little plague, off of a little pestilence uh, that is covering the world right now. It's driving everything in the world. In fact, this speaks of famine. They're saying that famine is on its way because of this plague that we're experiencing right now because of coronavirus. Uh, they say that we're going to experience a worldwide famine, that there's going to be shortages. Listen, fire. She will be burned up with fire for the Lord God who judges her, look at this, is strong. Let me give you the fourth thing. And the fourth thing is her destitution. She's destitute. This evil government, we will lose everything that brings any joy to life. Look at verse 22 and verse 23. Let me just show you this quickly. And the sound of the harpist and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard of in you any longer. Isn't that interesting? You ever stop to think how much of our society is driven by music? I love music. I love all kind of music. I listen to, um, I, I, I absolutely love Beethoven. Now I know y'all look at me like, good Lord, what's wrong with you? We knew you were off your, I do. I just love Beethoven. I love Beethoven. I love Mozart. I love Bach. I love classical music. But I want to tell you, I love sacred music. Uh, the Temptations, uh, Diana Ross, you know. And I, I do. Motown, you know. I, it's, that's, uh, that's almost the hymn book right there, you know. Anyway, I like that. I love Frank Sinatra. I like a little bit of this. I like a little bit of that. Music is very much a part of our lives. We love it. We enjoy it. He says there's coming a day because of this there's going to be the sound of no music, no singing whatsoever, no joy, no happiness there, nothing. The feeling that music brings about, he says none of it. Then he comes to the craftsman, verse 22. He says there will be no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. So many of us, I love to work. I love my job. I get up early in the morning and enjoy do. I, I can't believe I get paid to do what I do. And yet, there's coming a day when everyone will have nothing to do, no work to express, no job to go to, and the sound of the mill will not be heard in you. That is, there will be no more agriculture. There will be the loss of all of this production of food. He comes in verse 23 and he says, the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. That's a spiritual word from God. Nowhere will you be able to turn in this day and get a thus saith the Lord. We've ignored it for so long that we're coming to a time where the prophet said there is a famine, not of food and water, but a famine of the Word of God. There'll be no light from God whatsoever. There will be no spiritual input at all anywhere. And then he says, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. What he's saying there, no more relationship, none None of the joy of marriage. None of the joy and happiness of family. We, we just spent um, a couple of nights with our grandkids and, 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 and through the shock and, and terror and the shock and awe of nine little grandchildren. It was fun, wasn't it? But we thank God we're home now. It was good to be with them. It was good to see them. It was good to watch how they could wreck a restaurant. Um, 
but and it not be your house. Anyway, none of that's going to be there. No relationship. All relationship will be gone. You see, do you see what he's saying in all of this? The destitution, the desolation, the defiance, the demise of this government. God's going to eradicate it. God will not allow godless government over mankind forever. He brings it to an end. It's interesting in how he does that. He brings this destruction about. The merchants will cry, the kings of the earth. If you read this chapter, verse 9, the kings of the earth, they weep, they lament. Verse 11, the merchants of the earth weep because they made money out of all of this. Uh, it supplied money. It supplied materialism. It supplied all of these things. And yet the end of it all came so quickly. Do you see in verse 8 it said in one day? Well, then he shifts from one day to look at what he says at the end of verse 10. For in one hour your judgment has come. Verse 17, for one hour such great wealth has been laid west, waste. In verse 19 at the end it comes and it says, within one hour she has been laid waste. In a short moment in human history, God will say, enough of all this. And it goes up, up, up in a puff of smoke. And the kings, the governments of the world stand back and look and they weep. And the merchants and the sailors and all of those who've made money out of all of this stand and weep because it's gone so quick. And you say, well, what's the word out of this? Twice God speaks to the church. Now, this is the unusual thing. Now, are you all with me? I've given you all of that to bring you to this moment. So wake up and listen now. Watch this. He speaks to the church. He gives the church two words right here. Verse 4, he comes and he says in verse 4, separation. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sin. He says the people of God are to come out from the culture and the sin of the culture and society. We're different. We're, we're to be as different from this culture and this society as anything could possibly be. The second thing he comes and he says in verse 20 is celebration, not just separation, but celebration. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. World ever treated you badly? Come on. World ever been unfair to you? Have you ever lost because of your Christian principle? You ever suffered because you tried to be like Christ in a situation? You ever struggled and done without? Others were promoted around you simply because they knew you to be a believer? Well, the Word of God says celebrate now because there's coming a day, listen, when God's going to set that all straight for His children. Now, here's the interesting thing. That's the church in the age of tribulation. In other words, in the period of the tribulation, people are being saved. In an evil empire, under Antichrist, people are coming to Jesus. In a day of a counterfeit church, a corrupt counterfeit church, People are coming to Christ. If people can come to Christ in that day, they're primed for it right now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. In 732, Vikings landed at a place called Lindisfarne in Scotland. And there, those Vikings simply walked in to the monastery there. And in the chapel of St. Cuthbert's, they slaughtered them so that Alcuin of York, I mentioned him earlier, wrote and said that the place was splattered and covered in the blood of the men of God. It began the age of the Vikings. Some of y'all have seen that television show that's on one of those, you know, Netflix or Hulu or whatever, one of those deals. You've watched that. 
Uh, I've not seen it. I'm kind of interested in it, but I've not seen it. But that's what began the age of the Viking. And for the next two to four hundred years, they sailed down the Scottish coast, the English coast, the Irish coast, all the way down and around into the Mediterranean. And everywhere they went, they were as brutal and as mean. They worshipped this trifecta of unholy gods. And out of the worship of these pagan gods, they were as brutal and as cruel and as mean as any group of people that ever lived. They would go in places and slaughter and eviscerate and behead men, women, children. It made absolutely no difference. They burned everything. They pillaged everything. They raped everything that walked. And then something, and let me tell you something. I'm giving you a piece of history that nobody really talks about in church history. Something happened in the midst of all that. Alcuin of York had gone back to all of those monasteries and told all the brethren there, the priests and the friars, you begin to pray for them, pray for them, pray for them. Pray for God not only to protect you, but pray for God to reach them. And what the church began to do was this. As those Vikings came and began to settle, they would send missionaries over to Scandinavia. Most of them were killed, but they would get there and they would share the gospel. And another would come and share the gospel. And another would come and share the gospel. And those who could not go over and share the gospel, they would meet these people in the marketplace. And there in the marketplace, these Christians began to share Jesus Christ so that within 400 years, all of Scandinavia had come to Jesus Christ. And by the time of October 31st with Luther, 1517, all of these Scandinavians who had come to Christ were now Lutheran and were Protestant so that they did not destroy Christianity in the British Isles, but that the Britons who had trusted Christ had overcome the evil in their day with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the word for the church today. We can overcome an evil day with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stand. All of us standing, our heads bowed. God may be speaking to you this morning. I pray that He is. If you're here and you've never trusted Him, you say, I'm not sure. I don't know that I understand all of this. Well, I'm going to tell you what you want to do is you want to come to Christ so that you miss all of this. You want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's the God who came and died for you. You know, it's interesting how many gods expect you to die for them. My dying for God won't do anything for my soul, but His dying for me saved me. Now, would I die for Christ? I like to think I would. But my dying for Christ would not save my soul. It was Christ dying for me that saved me. He died for you. He died to pay the penalty of your sin, to give you the opportunity in this moment to put your faith and your trust in Him. To simply say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I can't do anything with my sin. But I come to trust you. And I thank you for dying on a cross and paying the penalty of my sin. And for being raised from the dead in order to give me eternal life. I pray that you pray that prayer. In fact, I'm going to be standing right here at the front. I'm going to give you the opportunity this morning. I'm going to put on a mask if you want to come to me. I want you to be able to do that. If you want to come and kneel at an altar, I have no idea what God is saying to you, but I'm telling you He's calling all of us to be a witness in the day in which we live. To share Jesus Christ with a world that's headed to what I just showed you in Revelation 17 and 18. Father, I pray that in these moments you would speak to our hearts. That Lord, if there are those that are watching by live stream or Facebook, for those that are here in this place, that we'd be willing to step forward and say, I'm trusting Jesus Christ this morning as my Lord and Savior. For I pray it in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, would you do that right now? As Kirkwood plays, you come 
and make that decision for Christ.